Thank you, uh, Professor Sharif. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great honor, really, to present Zuta uh, of Stellara Inusi here in the Egyptian Digestive Disease Week. I would like to start by thanking Professor Sarah Zakaria for the kind invitation and all the organizing committee for the great work they are doing. And uh, I would like to start by thanking also Professor Sheikh Nigaura and Professor Ayman Yusri and thanking Janssen, who had made a great step forward in the field of gastroenterology, in, especially in IBD in Egypt. And we are all uh, noticing the high dynamic uh, and the high uh, valuable work they are performing with uh, very rich scientific activities uh, through the last five years. And I think if they are not confident of their portfolio, they wouldn't invest much in that uh, field. So um, my talk today is about Stellara in ulcerative colitis. Are we heading really to a better outcome? <clears throat> the, uh, In fact, uh, uh, tumor necrosis factor antibody and biologic therapy was introduced to the field of uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, when the first case report was published in Lancet in 1994 by Dr. Dirks of a young girl uh, of 12 years uh, old uh, presenting with Crohn's disease that received monoclonal antibodies, the anti-TNF at the time, and they reported the good outcome. And since then, uh, many reports have been published and uh, many papers have been published on the efficacy of uh, entity and F in uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, we all know that uh, entity and F work by, in, in, uh, by blocking the TNF alpha, which uh, is secreted by macrophage and uh, prevents its effect on uh, target cells uh, that induce the inflammatory cascade. I wouldn't go to the mechanism of action of anti TNF today. Uh, the objective of use of anti TNF in the field of uh, IBD, especially in Crohn's disease, uh, first indication was uh, Crohn's disease, was to alter the natural course, the natural history, the progress of the disease. By inducing and maintaining uh, GI healing, we prevent stricture and prevent and penetrating complication we uh, may decrease or prevent extra intestinal complications, and we uh, decrease hospitalization, surgery, and mortality. And by that, we decrease long-term cost of care of IBD patients. By controlling um, inflammation, it's well proved that we maintain good health, we improve the quality of life, and we reduce the need the first entity NF that was available was infliximab, then uh, golimumab and adalimumab were uh, the first human antibody, totally human, because the infliximab was chimeric with the red part uh, uh, on the F, on the fab uh, portion. Then uh, sertolizumab, who didn't know a real success in the in, in uh, Crohn's disease. Then came the results of sonic remission uh, of sonic study. I was honored to be with Professor Colombel uh, while we were presenting. Our team was presenting the sonic uh, uh, results in uh, 2010 in the uh, ECHO Congress. And we showed that combo therapy uh, joining the uh, infliximab with, uh, uh, with other immune modulator, other uh, as a thioprene uh, or 6 mercaptopurine, uh, had better outcome. Uh, by reducing the um, uh, uh, of the uh, anti-drug antibodies, and uh, that in uh, increased the uh, proportion of patients who uh, noticed remission. However, that came with a price to pay. The risk of serious infection was increased um, uh, for in anti-TNF, especially in infliximab treated patients, um, and the risk of T cell lymphoma uh, was uh, noted in, um, uh, in patients receiving uh, the combo therapy with immune uh, suppressive therapy. And uh, as we know, uh, as uh, there is a relative increase in the relative risk of T cell lymphoma, especially in the pediatric population. What about ulcerative colitis? Ulcerative colitis treatment follows a, a sequential therapy mode and still is preserving that uh, 
module. So we evaluate the patient according to the severity, either it's mild, moderate, or severe, and we start with a minus salicylates for induction and maintenance. If the patient is not responding, we may add a conventional therapy like thiopurine, azathioprine. If not, we can go to biologic therapy, and our aim is to prevent the patient from colectomy. So what about the results of NT-TNF in ulcerative colitis? For induction, the infliximab uh, was uh, in ACT-1 and ACT-2 stu uh, studies uh, showed the patient uh, showed uh, up to 69% or 65% of clinical response, less patients went to remission during the induction, up to only 40% were in remission. That means they were cured or they were in deep remission. For adalimumab, results are, are less. We know that it's about 55 uh, as a response, so the patient is feeling better, and we have many criteria to, uh, to evaluate the response, but only about 20% went to remission. For adalimumab, it's about only uh, 18%. So that's for induction. What about maintenance? What about maintaining the treatment? The infliximab term uh, results uh, showed that the patients who were maintained on infliximab, only 40% or 46% were in clinical response, while only 35% maintained the remission. They evaluated the mucosal healing. Only half of the patient had response. For adalimumab, the results were less. And for golimumab, it's only 23% were maintained remission in one year. So uh, we know that every year, 20% of patients on NTT and F will, will lose their response to the treatment. So we have around 40% primary non response, and every year we will lose additional 20%. So in one or two years, we'll have the, uh, more than half of the people who have, were induced, uh, to, um, induced to treatment by NTCNF will be out of response, will lose their response. We have poor prognostic factors in ulcerative colitis disease severity. Uh, it's well proven that when the age of diagnosis is less than 40, when the patient is presenting with extensive colitis, when he's having severe endoscopic disease index, when he's, uh, he's needing hospitalization for colitis, uh, he's having elevated CRP, low serum albumin, the greater the number of poor prognostic factors, the worse the prognosis as measured by the likelihood of colitis. Therapeutic management, as I said in UC, should be guided by assessment of disease activity and disease prognosis. However, Patient with mildly active UC and prognostic factors associated with an increased risk of hospitalization or surgery, as I noted, should be treated with therapies for moderately to severely active disease. If the patient, even if he's having mildly active UC, but he's having many risk factors of uh, poor prognosis, of need of, sur uh, of surgery or hospitalization, you have to treat him from the start with therapy catered for moderately to severely active disease. Why? Because it is well proven that if we maintain the patient in remission and deep remission, no symptoms, normal labs, normal endoscopy, he has a mucosal healing by uh, histology, we, the outcome is clear that we decrease the hospitalization, we avoid him from going to surgery, and he's having minimal to uh, no disability. So this is the outcome. You have to set your goals to have the outcome. When choosing a drug, the question is always, do you need a sprinter, a drug that will reach your goal in a very quick time, or you need a marathon that maintain the uh, remission and the quiescence of the disease for a long time? It's better, of course, if we can combine those two athletes together. Uh, so we, uh, most of the time I'm asked, uh, I have a patient with a UC, how, what would be the first uh, biologic therapy you have to choose? In fact, it's not that simple. There are many factors that, uh, that helps you to answer that question. It's not, not 
only a term of price or the age, or it's a portfolio. That's why it's a tailoring a treatment to a specific patient. You cannot apply the same rules to each patient, even if they are having the same disease, but there are many drug factors, patient factors, clinical factor at the initiation, physician factors, all this factor has to enter. I will not detail all of this factor, but you have to take into account all the factors within the treatment to your patient because it will affect his life. We still have unmet needs in treatment of ulcerative colitis in spite of all the drugs that we have in our arsenal. First, a large of unmet medical need still exists with respect to efficacy, as I have shown, uh, as I have shown with the first generation of biologic, uh, biologic therapy, the remission rates remain less than ideal. Second, the safety is an important consideration for patient and clinician. Third, of course, we are not in a very rich country, so payers are under enormous financial pressure from the high cost of biologic therapy. So you have to calculate the cost benefit um, uh, ratio when choosing your first biologic therapy. Why do we uh, go to the uh, anti-cytokine uh, drugs? In fact, we know that in inflammatory bowel disease, there are many uh, inflammatory pathways that are activated. For, uh, for example, the, anti, uh, the interleukin-12 is involved in, in Crohn's disease. The interleukin-6 and 23 and TGF-beta uh, are involved in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis through the TH17, the interleukin-17, and the interleukin-4 through the T-helper-2 uh, uh, is only uh, involved in ulcerative colitis. So we are targeting the inflammatory pathway to dampen the inflammation. The anti-interleukin-12, 23, uh, both have a P40 subunit that is shared with those two essential pro-inflammatory interleukins. The downstream signal of this complex has been shown to activate other T cells and myeloid cells. In fact, the activated antigen-presenting cells in the gut uh, human secrete the, anti, uh, the interleukin-12 and 23, which is a con a con uh, considered as inflammation gateway. So they were initiate the inflammatory cascade by uh, um, uh, activating and helping the differentiation of T helper cells to the TH1 and TH17, and they will activate the naive natural killer cells to activated natural killer cells. And those cells who will secrete the TNF-alpha interleukin-1 and other inflammatory cytokines to initiate and to uh, maintain the inflammatory process. So in, instead of blocking the TNF-alpha and uh, the other pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines, we can uh, block the airport. So in spite of canceling a flight, you can block the airport. You can close the airport to dampen the uh, inflammatory cascade. So we, you block the interleukin-12 and 23, there will, this will dampen the inflammatory cascade by decreasing the uh, stimulation of uh, T helper cells and naive natural killer cells and decrease the effector cytokines. And in this way, you will uh, decrease the, inflam the inflammation in the gut. Stellara is not uh, a recent drug. It was introduced in 2009 in flakes rises. It was safe uh, to pediatric population in 2015, was approved for pediatric plague rises, has a role in psoriatic arthritis, but it was introduced to the field of uh, inflammatory bowel disease to gastroenterology in 2016 in Crohn's disease, was approved, and uh, had the FDA approval for the use uh, in ulcerative colitis in moderately to severe patients in 2019. So we are having a drug with more than 10 years of back record. It was the American College of Gastroenterology um, has included Stellara as a first line biologic option for patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease. And the ECHO guidelines also included, uh, recommended the use of estekinumab for induction of remission in patients with moderate to severe active lunar Crohn's disease, and that had a strong recommendation, high quality evidence. So it's highly 
recommended. Stellara is the first and the only approved interleukin, anti-interleukin inhibitor um, uh, now approved for the treatment of moderately to severely active Crohn's disease and UC. In Crohn's disease, it has a clinical response that uh, reach up to 56%, uh, rapid response, uh, clinical remission was maintained in up to 53% of patients and up to three years uh, extension um, uh, um, uh, studies that showed that 74% of uh, Stellara responded for the conventional therapy failure patient group were in durable remission up to three years of maintaining the remission. And the safety profile was well proved and I will show you the results. Um, as for the use of the Stellara, it's very simple. You can use a simple, a single IV induction dose administrated over at least one hour and the dose is calculated according to the body weight. Less than 55 kilogram, you need only two vials of Stellara 130 milligram. From 55 to 85, three, up to three vials. And more than 85 kilogram, you will need uh, up to four vials of the 130 milligram for induction. Then we have two regimens of maintenance, either every 12 weeks, a uh, 90 milligram uh, subcutaneous injection, or you can go, if the patient is more severe, you can go uh, to the eight, uh, every eight uh, weeks uh, subcutaneous uh, injection. I'm here uh, today to uh, speak about the UNIFI uh, study that uh, tested and uh, evaluated the use of uh, osteokinumab of Stellara in uh, ulcerative colitis. The primary end point was at eight weeks uh, to uh, the target was that Stellara, patient receiving Stellara with, uh, ha, with, uh, will experience clinical remission that had two definition, a global definition, my score less than two with no individual score more than one or uh, US definition for the states, uh, it's uh, counting the number of stools, the rectal bleeding subscore and the Mayo endoscopic score. So this is a primary endpoint. We have uh, five uh, secondary endpoints at week uh, uh, eight. The clinical response, patient decreasing, uh, the decrease of Mayo score more than 30% and more than three points with either a decrease of rectal bleeding or, uh, or a rectal bleeding score of zero to one. Endoscopic healing, histological healing, Mucosal healing that combines both endoscopic and histological healing for the first time to have such an objective uh, target is to have an objective measure of infection. Not only the feeling of the patient, not only the evaluation of the physician, but also the histological and the mucosal healing. And of course, uh, by the end, we will test the quality of life change from baseline. So Stellara study design in adult patient who is moderately to severely active UC who had an inadequate response to or failed to tolerate biologic like entity and F and or vedolizumab or conventional therapy like steroids and other immune modulator. It was designed, as I said, to test clinical remission, clinical response, steroid free clinical remission. And for the first time, uh, HEMI score HISTO endoscopic mucosal improvement index. The study went to uh, randomize patients to three arms. The ostekinumab induction by fixed dose of 130 milligram IV or the body weight um, uh, approach, six milligram per kilogram induction or a placebo. And the patient were evaluated at week 10 and the patient who received the placebo, who didn't respond, uh, could have uh, uh, an induction, an open label induction with the with map, six milligram per kilogram as for induction, and were evaluated at 16 a week and were considered as late responder. Uh, then the patient who responded were included in the maintenance study, as I will say later. I will not go to details of the uh, characteristic of the patient, but, but I have to note that more than uh, around 50% of the patients included in the UNIFI study were not biologic uh, naive 
her, were experienced to previous biologic, either anti-CNF or vedolizumab. So uh, this is a very hard treat uh, to treat patient population. To up to 50% of the patient were not biologic naive. So what about results uh, at eight week and at week 16 for patient for the late responder? At week eight, up to 67% of non-biologic failure patients for the biologic naive patient uh, uh, experience clinical uh, response. And up to 62% of all the patient, either biologic failure or biologic naive, uh, experience that response. If, if we combine those patients with the late responder, the ratio will be up to 80% per, uh, uh, percent of patients who receive the induction by the osteokinumab, the weight-based approach, six milligram per kilogram, receive uh, experience clinical response. The patient told that they are feeling better, up to 80, uh, 87%, and in a very short duration of time, in only eight weeks after receiving the proper drug with the proper regimen. And up to 80% of all the patients, of course, the biologic failure uh, have a less response than the biologic naive patient. What, are, uh, what about other parameters? The clinical remission, clinical remission means the patient is in deep quiescence, up to 50% only after eight weeks. It's a very short duration in a very hard to treat population. So 15% is a really very good number. Endoscopic improvement up to 27% and a histological improvement. One third of the patient has an histological improvement in only eight weeks. It's very, really great results. Other objective way of measuring the inflammation is testing the fecal calprotectin. And if you can uh, see here the decrease of fecal calprotectin compared in the uh, six milligram per kilogram, the weight-based approach, of induction compared to the group that received the placebo, there is a tremendous decrease of the fecal calprotectin. So summary of efficacy of induction. In the patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, ostekinumab administrated as a single IV induction of 130 milligram or six milligram per kg, induced clinical remission, induced endoscopic healing, improved health quality, health-related quality of life, and induced mucosal healing, but overall the efficacy data suggests that the efficacy of the weight-based approach, six milligram per kilogram dose, is better than 130 milligram as observed with clinical response, change from baseline in partial meal score and inflammatory marker. And that's why the six milligram kilogram per dose is a maintained uh, regimen, and this is approved uh, regimen now to use in the real life. What about the maintenance? Uh, therapy, patients who responded to estaclinumab, either in the 130 or the weight-based approach, were randomized to three arms. One arm will receive the sub-Q every 12 weeks, and one arm will receive the sub-Q every eight weeks, and the last will receive the placebo, and they will be followed up to 40 weeks, and 40 plus eight, that's 52, around 52, one year, we will evaluate the response of uh, treatment of estaclinumab in moderate to severe UC in one year. We will see the results. So the patient who received every, uh, osteokinumab every eight weeks, of course, did better than those who received every 12 weeks. But overall, around 44% of patients uh, had a clinical remission. They were in essence. Endoscopic improvement was noted in half the patients and corticosteroid-free clinical remission was noted in 40% of the, around 40% of the patients. That's a very large number to the, for a patient not to use steroids for one year in 40% of this hard to treat population. It's very good result. Stellara delivered a lasting remission at one year. What I want to show in this slide that in bio-naive patients, around 50% had uh, maintained clinical remission in one year in the group that received uh, Stellara every eight weeks. And among the patients in clinical remission and one year with Stellara, 96% uh, were steroid free. Are almost 100% were not using steroids through one year of 
uh, use of Stellara in uh, ulcerative colitis. So it's something to take into account because the use of steroids denotes the presence of uh, periods of inflammation in, uh, during the treatment. For the first time, Stellara achieved a histoendoscopic mucosal improvement with Hello? Dr. Mohammed, continue your presentation. So, uh, I'm saying that, I, yes. Uh, I, just, around... I just like to remind you that you have a couple of minutes, so please try to be on okay. time, uh, Professor Nathan. Okay. I have, uh, so I, I will uh, resume. So, around um, uh, in one year, 44% of the patient uh, experienced uh, uh, an objective measure of inflammation uh, decrease, which is a histoendoscopic mucosal improvement. In the bionaive patients, 50% had uh, uh, an improvement in the histo in the HEMI score. So they were in deep re re reduction of inflammation. For those who achieved remission, symptomatic remission at one year, they maintained this remission up to two years in the LTA, in the long-term extension uh, uh, study, up to two years, the, the, the patient maintained the response in the uh, eight week uh, uh, regimen, uh, subcutaneous every eight weeks. So as for safety, uh, at one year evaluation, a patient who received Stellara had less than 1% hypersensitivity reaction. The malignancy rate was less than 1%. The serious infection was less than 2% and was not different from those who received the placebo. And the, uh, as for the antibodies, less than 5% of the patient developed antibodies. And the, really, it's totally different from uh, the first generation of, anti, of biologic therapy, the anti -TNF. So the safety of Stellara was evaluated in uh, two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled studies in up to 1,000 other patients, and it showed that it has a very good safety profile. To conclude, and I will come to my two uh, last two uh, uh, slides, Stellara is the first and the only FDA-approved UC treatment to achieve histoendoscopic mucosal improvement. It comes with a 10 years back record uh, used in other um, uh, diseases. It has a very high efficacy from a single induction IV dose and high percentage of responders. Lasting efficacy with a minimal corticosteroid use, consistent safety profile and convenient dosing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Nedi. That was very illustrative and very informative. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but uh, maybe uh, you can just tell us about the systemic effect of Stilara very shortly in only in only a few seconds, please, because uh, Professor Ayman has to end the session very soon. So go ahead, please. As I, as I said, the mechanism of action of Stilara blocks two main pathways, the TH1 and TH17. So it has uh, its role in uh, extraintestinal manifestations of uh, the inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it has, it was well proven that um, not, um, it doesn't play on the homing of uh, leukocytes. So it has a more systemic mechanism of action. It, it can uh, help to dampen the inflammation, gut related and non gut related. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you think... Professor Mohammed, for a very illustrative presentation. Before ending this uh, session, very nice and interesting session, I'd like to ask you, when would you use a biologic therapy as a first-line uh, therapy in patients with UC? Okay. For um, the sequential therapy is still uh, the base, but we have to consider 
uh, several factors while deciding the initial therapy for the patient. And as I uh, showed in a slide, there are many risk factors of poor prognosis. So the higher the number of risk factors the patient has, the I would tend to use a highly efficient drug uh, from the beginning and not to wait complications, not to wait the patient to come with uh, an, a severe anemia, high CRP, low albumin, extraintestinal manifestation. I would tend to use my best weapon from the beginning, top down, not to step up uh, in the therapy. So, so in, your, in, your, in your practice, Professor Mohammed, did you ever use biologic therapy as a first line before trying steroids and perhaps as a thyprin and other immunosuppressants? Yes, it happened many times even, Dr. Ayman. According to the presentation, the severity of the presentation, I have, for a, uh, if the patient is presenting with extensive colitis, a young age, severe anemia, needing hospitalization, I would not wait uh, to, to for a trial of steroids and uh, conventional therapy for six weeks. I will uh, start from with the best weapon I have from the beginning, if the patient is severe enough to be hospitalized. Do you think there is a role in the presence of biologic therapy? Is there a role for other immunosuppressants like cyclosporin and uh, microfinulate, uh, tacrolimus, or do you think you should go immediately to biologic therapy? For, for years, uh, Professor Ayman, we had a, a difficulty with using cyclosporin, MMF, and other uh, immune suppressant therapy. For years, we were waiting for uh, uh, medications that uh, will help to decrease inflammation with no major side effects like we, what was noted with the, the, those immune suppressant therapy. The, the infections we noted in those patients receiving cyclosporin, MMF, and other immune therapy was really a problem and was posing a, a, a life-threatening uh, condition for those patients, uh, for uh, those chronic patients. So yes, I would uh, say that uh, bi new biologics uh, will change the course of the disease we will tend to treat our uh, most severe patients with the best weapon we'll have from the beginning. Thank you, Professor Mohammed. I think we have to end this session.